Hello, and welcome to the 1999 Distinguished RC Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Scott Tyler. I'm with the University of Nevada at Reno. Over the last year, during 1999, I had the pleasure of giving the lecture series around the country and around the world. The lecture series is sponsored by the National Groundwater Association and the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers. And I want to thank them for just a wonderful opportunity to travel around the country and around the world and see outstanding students and faculty doing great work in, in hydrogeology and hydrology. We're filming this in front of a not-so-live audience, just one person on the camera, so I expect all of you to, uh, to break in and laugh when necessary when I tell the jokes. Okay, what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is groundwater recharge in arid regions and looking at uh, current recharge and then past recharge. And we're going to be focusing mostly on the area called the Vado zone, the unsaturated zone, the, surf, the, uh, the area between the land atmosphere interface and the groundwater table. And if we're going to be doing that, we're going to be talking about dirt. Okay, now, if you're at a land-grant institution, I apologize for the use of the word dirt because obviously that's a fairly negative term to you, but if you're not, you can laugh at it anyway. Um, what you can see is here, uh, we've been studying dirt for a heck of a long time. Uh, early scientists even understood that uh, dirt tended to have significant amounts of organic complexes in it. Now, since that time, we've made some significant progress. Okay? Since then, we've figured out that there's isotopes of dirt. Now, this is meant to be a little funny, so keep laughing, but uh, it's also meant to be a little bit illustrative with respect to where the contributions in the science have been made in, in the study of hydrology in the Vado zone, or unsaturated fluid flow. And I want to point out that, that this, uh, this slide's really meant to, to get the students thinking about uh, where, do, where have we made the progress. Faculty, uh, oh, we tend not to visit each other too much in different disciplines, but you students can still do that. For instance, civil engineers have made some tremendous strides in understanding the processes that go on in, in soils, particularly strength of soil, soil mechanics, uh, bridge foundations, things like that. Um, hydrogeologists, well, we've kind of discovered dirt in the last few years. Uh, the Vado zone, it's an area of, uh, of quite intense study with respect to contaminant transport from the land surface down to the water table. The agronomists, I've been fortunate enough to work with a whole lot of agronomists over my career, have made tremendous strides in understanding solute transport, uh, root water uptake, heat flow, things like that in soils. Uh, geologists as well, even mining engineers looking at uh, things like tailings impoundments and tailings dams. So a tremendous amount of, of disciplines have added to our understanding of, of how water and solutes and heat move in, in what we call soil or the Vado zone. And unfortunately, we often don't communicate with each other. We often stick in our little uh, discipline and we don't go across the, the quad or the campus to go talk to somebody else. So I just encourage you as students and faculty to visit with each other because you'll find out that, yeah, the civil engineers use a little bit different terminology perhaps, but they're studying the same thing, okay? Now, in that vein, uh, I want to put uh, credit where credit is due for much of the work you're going to see today. Um, and you'll see that I've had a real fortunate career in working with people from a variety of disciplines, and you'll see that as I go through the contributors to this talk. Um, the graduate students, obviously the graduate students do most of the work for any faculty member, as most of you know. Uh, Peter Hartso is here at UNR with me, Michelle Valvord and Joe Sterling at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology have contributed quite a bit of data analysis to uh, some of the data you'll see from the Nevada test site. And then a uh, uh, series of, of Vado zone investigations we did back in the early 90s. Uh, Jenny Chapman from the Desert Research Institute, she's a geochemist, isotope geochemist. Uh, Steve Conrad, Steve's a hydrogeologist, uh, fluid mechanics from Sandia. Uh, Dale Hammermeister is with uh, soil physicist. Julie Miller down here, she's a civil engineer interested in overland flow components. Um, Fred Phillips, a geochemist, a Renaissance geochemist. He's done a tremendous amount of work in a variety of hydrologic settings. And Mike Sully, also a soil physicist. So those are the contributors directly to the data you're going to see. And you can see they're from a wide variety of disciplines. And without that interdisciplinary approach, we wouldn't have gotten anywhere with trying to understand the data that we have. The remaining folks on this list are people who've kept me honest over my career and helped me a tremendous amount in understanding uh, fluid flow processes and soils in the unsaturated zone. Okay, so let's get to the, to the heart of the talk. What are we going to talk about? 
Well, I'll give you some of the, uh, the motivation as to why we should study recharge and water movement in the Vedo zone, particularly in arid regions. What's our rationale? Why should we even bother to do this? By way of some field examples, introduce uh, several independent methods to estimate what is the current state of recharge today in some arid regions, uh, particularly in the in southern Great Basin. And then going back in time a little bit through the use of environmental tracers, try to reconstruct what happened as the, we know the climate was dramatically different over the past uh, tens of thousands of years, but how did that, how did the groundwater system, how did the soil system respond to those changes in climate? And then we'll finally finish out with some conclusions and some, a few words of caution. Okay, so why should we study first recharge, modern recharge? Who cares? Okay, well it's, if we're going to be good stewards of our, of our resources and our land use, um, we should be considering our groundwater resources as sustainable. Okay, if that's the case, then the pumping of groundwater resources must, at least on some average, either yearly or decadal, uh, equal the recharge rate. How much is being replenished to the aquifers every, every year or, again, averages over decades perhaps might be more appropriate. To do that, we have to have some idea of what is the current state of replenishment. What's the current state of recharge to these groundwater systems? And that's quite difficult in arid regions. Now secondly, so that's kind of why should we study recharge today. Secondly, Vado zones, and particularly the ones in the arid regions, these unsaturated zones, they can be very deep, several hundred meters from the land surface to the groundwater, are more and more being viewed as dumping grounds, okay, for society's wastes. Either radioactive, hazardous, municipal waste, uh, you name it. There's hope that we could put this stuff in, in desert environments and because of the slow rates of water movement and, the, and the, the slow transport times, isolate it from the biosphere for significant amounts of time. Now if we're going to do that, and particularly if we have some waste that has some long time scales of toxicity, then we need long time scale predictions of recharge. What's going to happen or what's likely to happen if, when the climate changes, either to a wetter or a drier climate, how will the recharge rates respond? Because the recharge rates are the primary mechanism to move contaminants from the land surface or the waste, wherever the waste is buried, to the water table, okay? And then finally, a little bit more esoteric, because we found in some of the sites we've looked at where there's very slow rates of water movement through the unsaturated zone and very low water contents, these thick unsaturated zones are capable of preserving paleoclimate signatures, paleo rain chemistries, um, over very long periods of time and recording how the landscape changed with respect to the changing climate. Okay? Do, when, when does significant recharge in arid regions occur? Okay? So those are the three things we'll kind of hit on today. We'll start, the talk is kind of broken into two parts. We'll look at modern recharge, how do we estimate it today, and then we'll look at paleo recharge on the second half of the talk. Now before we do that, I want to kind of get us all on the same page with respect to terminology. Because again, terminology from different disciplines, it all means the same, but we all use our own terms. Let's start over here on the left of this slide where we show a very simple picture of uh, infiltration. We'll call the water which passes the land atmosphere interface, we'll call that infiltration. That's the stuff that rains down on the land surface. Um, then we have some vegetation. Okay, the vegetation can uptake water and solutes and nutrients. Um, what moves out of the root zone, drains out of the bottom of the root zone and heading down toward the water table, we'll call that net infiltration. Okay, that's the residual. That's what's left. And then that water, when it reaches the water table, we'll call that recharge. Okay, it's a fairly standard uh, term we all know about. Now, in more humid environments uh, or where the distance from the root zone to the water table is fairly small, Net infiltration and recharge are the same thing. It rains, after a couple of weeks, water moves through the, through the soil, uh, and it moves to the water table, and the recharge is fairly fast. But the sites I'm going to show you, the rate of net infiltration might be only a couple of millimeters per year, or even less, of water. And the distance that it might has to have to traverse from the root, root zone down to the water table might be a few hundred meters, okay? So we almost have a disconnect between what's happening today beneath the root zone controlled by the modern climate, and what's recharging the water table, okay? Particularly, this would give you some thoughts then about how we might be able to use these unsaturated zones as archives of paleoclimate, okay? Because they may preserve recharge events which happened quite some time ago. Okay, now that's fairly simple. Let's talk about how water moves through the unsaturated zone or the Vado zone or soil zone or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter to me. 
In the center here, we have something called piston flow. The light blue color is, of course, uh, is, is infiltrating water. Theta is the water content, so we have a, some theta F, which is the water content behind the wetting front, and then it's infiltrating into some fairly dry soil. Okay, now what you can see from this plot is that the infiltration is fairly uniform in space. Okay, there's no variation in the infiltration rate. Water's moving down kind of like a piston, and in, ca in fact, we call that piston flow. Very simple, and it's well described and easy to model. Okay, now it often doesn't happen that way, unfortunately, because Mother Nature gives us lots of confounding problems. Um, on the right-hand side of this plot, I show what I'll call generically preferential flow. Okay, water that, that is moving down in a very non-uniform nature. Um, and again, you can see these, these fingers. There's, this can occur over all different scales. It can occur at the micro scale due to instabilities and essentially rich, uh, Darcy's law. Okay? We can set up instabilities. It can be due to heterogeneity in the porous media, okay? layering or heterogeneity in the, in, the, in the soil texture, water content, things like that. It can also be due up at the land surface to heterogeneity in the upper boundary conditions. Okay? This could be the, across the top scale here. This could be multiple kilometers, and we could be looking then across uh, changes in the land surface with respect to water flux. We might have here some kind of an ephemeral uh, uh, stream channel that occasionally runs and produces significantly more moisture, which allows much deeper infiltration. Okay, so those are the things that kind of confound us. Now, the data I'm going to show you today are, come from a series of boreholes drilled through a very deep unsaturated zone, or a couple of unsaturated zones. Now, we looked, with a borehole, we looked down at a, at a volume about that size, okay? We looked down, one little snapshot of the unsaturated zone. Now, what happens if my one snapshot happens to be here, okay, or over here? I'm going to get a very different picture of what I think the rates of recharge and the rates of moisture flux might be to the water table, okay? Now, to get around that, because I don't know, I don't know where I, you know, whether I'm going to be here or over here, the techniques that we have to use to estimate recharge have to be able to quantify whether we're seeing this kind of preferential flow phenomenon or something that's more akin to piston flow. Okay? And it's critical to use multiple methods. Uh, some of the techniques I'm going to show you are fairly sensitive to this preferential flow and might indicate that yes, we have it or no, we don't. Other techniques are insensitive to it. So I'm going to show you multiple methods that we're going to use to estimate recharge and fluxes of water. Um, and keep this in mind, okay? Are we able to discern this kind of, this kind of phenomena? Now, we're going to be working in uh, some of the drier areas of, of uh, the uh, continental United States. We're going to be working in Nevada. In fact, we're going to be working in southern Nevada at a place called the Nevada Test Site. This is a site where most of the above-ground and below-ground nuclear weapons were tested by the United States over the last oh, 40, 50 years, something like that. Um, it's, uh, the Nevada test site is about 100 kilometers north and west of Las Vegas. The two sites I'm going to talk to you about both come in, uh, they're both from the, the, well, the whole region is in the basin and range geographic province. Okay, the basin and range, if you haven't been out in this part of the country, north-south trending mountain ranges all the way across Nevada with uh, deep alluvial filled valleys which uh, fill the the valleys, okay? Generally internally drained with respect to surface flow, um, externally drained with respect to groundwater flow, but we basically have mountains that run north and south, uh, composed of fractured crystalline or limestone, things like that. And then these basins filled with alluvium, okay? It can be several, several kilometers of alluvium. The two sites I'm going to talk to you about are both in these alluvial filled valleys. One is up in the central part of the Nevada test site, a place called Yucca Flat. Okay, this is where most of the testing occurred. It's right here. The other site is down in the southern part of the Nevada test site, a place called Frenchman Flat. And this is where we currently, or the Department of Energy currently disposes of low-level radioactive waste. So there's an ongoing site there for disposal. Now, most of you have probably heard of Yucca Mountain. Okay, Yucca Mountain is the proposed high-level waste repository for the United States. Um, high-level meaning reactor rods and things that are pretty pretty nasty and toxic. That's proposed right here on the western boundary of the Nevada test site. So it's different from Yucca Flat, where I'm going to be talking to you. It's a very different environment. Okay? It's also in the unsaturated zone. The proposed area where they're going to put the waste is in the unsaturated zone. But it's in a fractured volcanic tuff, so a fairly uh, 
competent rock with lots of fractures and very low permeability matrix but very high permeability fractures. Very different environment. Also topographically a little bit higher than where we're working. Okay, so the first site, Frenchman Flat. One of the unique things about Southern Nevada is the depth to water. Okay, incredibly deep water tables. Frenchman Flat, the depth to water is about 240 meters. Okay, incredibly deep. Uh, it's an arid region, 124 millimeters per year of annual precipitation, roughly over the last 40 years. Now at this site, we were lucky, okay? We had three deep and about 15 or so shallow core holes that we drilled in this, in fairly close vicinity, within a couple kilometers of each other. These holes were drilled with air, so we didn't add any moisture to the unsaturated zone, and they were, some of them were continuously cored, not all of them, we ran out of money, um, but they were cored and the samples brought to the surface, and then we could look at the water potential, the water content, uh, the solute concentration, things like that in these fairly intact cores. Now, why would we drill all these holes? Well, regulatory purposes. There's a low-level or ra low-level radioactive waste disposal site in this area in Frenchman Flat, and then Department of Energy asked us and a few other of the, of the uh, site contractors, well, is this a good site? They've been using it for 30 or 40 years, um, they decided we ought to check and make sure, try to understand what is the direction of water mo motion underneath this site? Is it, is, it, is it intact? Are we leaking radioactivity? Um, how fast do things, will things move to the water table? So we drilled a lot of holes and did a lot of characterization. Now here, the Vado zone, it's fairly nice. It's fairly homogeneous, although it's heterogeneous. And I'll show you that in just a second. Um, it's primarily sandy alluvial textured sediments. They're slightly cemented. They kind of stand. If you dig a trench, the stuff stands vertically. Um, and a fairly high hydraulic conductivity, saturated conductivity, about 10 to the minus 4 centimeters per second. Um, not particularly heterogeneous. Uh, we had a lot of measurements of hydraulic conductivity, saturated K, and they vary the, the albine order magnitude or two, which is actually fairly small heterogeneity. Okay? Now, the core holes, all of them are located on, on distal fan surfaces. That is, these are alluvial fans. I'll show you a picture in just a minute. And we've got native vegetation. Okay, at least it was native until we drilled all the holes and all the trucks came on and kind of destroyed things a little bit. But it was native to start with. All right, this is just a photograph of the site looking to the west. This is the low-level radioactive waste disposal site. You can see in this photograph uh, in the center parts, you can see some trenches. Uh, this is a typical low-level waste disposal. Material is, uh, is dumped into unlined trenches and then covered, okay? Um, we dispose of our hazardous waste in much more, uh, how should I say, ingenious ways with liners and covers and all kinds of multiple barrier systems. Low-level waste in this country, be it Department of Energy or commercial waste, is simply disposed of in barrels in unlined disposal trenches. Okay, that's been the practice. That remains the practice today. And you tell me if you think that's a reasonable practice for some of these kinds of wastes, given where we stand with respect to our understanding of solute transport. Okay, I think we have a ways to go. Um, anyway, the site is, uh, as you can see, it's fairly arid. These little uh, uh, tiny dots down here, these are Nevada trees. These are little tiny bushes that are about this big, okay? Laria tridentata, uh, creosote bush, as well as a few other things. The site is on an alluvial fan. You can see mountains in the background. You can see some drainages here. You can see some drainages coming across here, okay? So it's active alluvial surfaces. The boreholes I'm going to talk to you about, well, there's one just off the picture here. There's another one someplace in here and another one kind of off in here, as well as some shallow ones, just to give you a sense of what the site looks like. Okay, now this is just uh, an idea to uh, show you what the unsaturated zone looks like with a, with a forklift truck for scale. Okay, I hope you can see this in the, uh, in the slide, but if you look here, you can see that, that the wall on the left-hand side, which is essentially the unsaturated zone, the top few meters of it, uh, is highly heterogeneous, lots of cobbles in there, typical alluvial fan and overbank type deposits. Okay, it's just a jumbled up mess. A fair amount of calcium carbonate kind of gluing things together and, um, and heterogeneous, okay? This is what we had to deal with. This is what the unsaturated zone looks like. Um, one thing to think about as we go through is I'm going to be, again, we're looking at little shots, little pinpricks down through the unsaturated zone. 
and I'm going to be assuming one dimensional flow. Okay? I don't have much choice in the matter. I only have a few points. Okay? Given the uncertainty and the heterogeneity you see in this, in this material, how reasonable an assumption is that? Okay? You think about that. Those are good questions to ask. And since you can ask me questions, since I won't be there, you can talk about them and, and, and I won't even be able to listen. Okay? Now, one thing. Um, are there any engineers in the crowd, particularly geotechnical or civil engineers? Okay? If there are, you have your work cut out for you. This, by the way, on the right-hand side, these plywood boxes, this is radioactive waste. Okay? Now, what is it? Well, it's uh, glove boxes, it's vials of stuff, who knows what it is. But it's contaminated at fairly low levels of uh, radioactivity. And it's dumped in plywood boxes. Now, eventually, and fairly soon, it would be nice to cover this waste trench okay, with some kind of a cover which is going to minimize infiltration, uh, minimize burrowing animals, getting down into the waste, uh, have some structural integrity, minimize erosion, okay, all kinds of things where basically we want to entomb this waste. Now what's going to happen in 50 or 100 years to these plywood boxes? Okay, they use steel boxes now, so maybe 500 years from now. These things are going to degrade okay, and compact and settle. And they're not going to settle nice and uniformly. Okay, they're going to settle differentially. So you're going to have some areas that, that the boxes just corroded and fell apart and this popped down. Now what, how do you build a cover? to go over the top of these, to do all those things I told you that we'd like to do, when the whole surface, when the whole waste may consolidate as much as 40 or 50 percent. Okay? These are some serious questions which are just kind of opening up. People are just beginning to think about these. And the same could be said for hazardous waste sites. We dispose of things in barrels. Uh, they're at fairly low densities off times. What's going to happen as those things consolidate? And we build these beautiful layered engineered covers and then the whole thing starts to com compress. Okay? Another thing to think about. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to the other site, Yucca Flat. Okay, Yucca Flat is, is where most of the nuclear testing occurred. And I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. Here it's even deeper to water. Okay, 450 meters to the water table. It's over half a almost a half a kilometer. Incredibly deep water table. It's a little wetter, 160 millimeters per year. Still quite arid climate. Now here, we didn't do very much drilling, but we had a deep core hole that was drilled back in the 70s. And it was drilled with air, a little bit of air foam, um, all the way through the unsaturated zone, and then deep, actually, beneath the water table. And that whole core, it was continuously cored, was archived. It was put in the, the core library at the Nevada test site. And we said, hey, this is a great opportunity. We can perhaps look at the material, maybe do some testing, look at some solutes that might be in the, in the core, uh, to try to understand recharge in this deep, unsaturated zone. Now, to make up for some, some lost core in the near surface, we drilled a shallow hole just in the top 50 meters. Now, this site is even more heterogeneous okay, than the last one. Here we have alluvium. We've got uh, reworked asphalt tufts. We've got some lacustrian sediments. Um, right at the bottom of the unsaturated zone, just where we get into the water table, there's welded volcanic tuff. Okay, so it's really heterogeneous much more so than the other material. And this hole is located on a, quote, undisturbed, it's fairly undisturbed native vegetation, but it's about two kilometers north of a playa, okay, or, or an ephemeral lake, which forms um, after significant rainstorm events and then goes away. So a little more complex. And again, this question about thinking of the unsaturated zones are heterogeneous. How can we interpret data in a simple way? Can we use one-dimensional approaches? Now, this is a picture looking to the south of Yucca Flat. Okay, the site that we're working in is way off here in the distance in this picture. Las Vegas is off in the haze to your left. Um, and you can see the playa, that little white line out there is actually Yucca Flat Playa. It may be a little hard to see in this slide. Now, there's some interesting things in this slide as well, which are probably worth talking about. There are probably some geologists out there watching this. Okay, here's a fault. Just so you know, okay, that little line that comes along here, um, that's what happens when you set off on the order of four or five hundred a below, uh, below ground nuclear weapons test in an extensional geologic terrain, you produce faults, okay? And there's about six meters of offset on this fault that's occurred over the last 30 or 40 years. Now, these other, these kind of dots that you see, and again, they may not show up too well here, 
But these are big circular depressions, okay? And they're about, some of them are a couple hundred meters across, 10, 20 meters in depth. And this is what happens after you blow up a nuclear bomb down at depth, okay? The bomb goes off somewhere down in the unsaturated zone or even in the saturated zone, okay? Vaporizes a ton of rock, or multiple tons, I should say, some volume, okay? And then things cool off, and now you have this cavity, this empty space in, in, the, in the rock. What happens? The material starts to fall in or cave into it. And it caves in all the way to the land surface and produces what the Department of Ener Energy euphemistically calls surface disruption features. Okay. I call them craters, but that's politically not so correct because it doesn't sound as good. But these are wonderful opportunities for infiltration. Okay. In fact, you can see, well, again, it's a little hard on this slide, but what happens when it rains? Uh, the landscape would love to return to its relatively flat topography. Okay, so overland flow is going to occur and try to move sediment and water into these uh, surface collapse features. Okay, and so after a good rainstorm, you get ponding in the bottom of these craters. And the hope was it will evaporate. Well, the truth is it doesn't. Okay, most of the water, this, these are fairly coarse sediments, and uh, most of the water which does run in, particularly early in the crater's life, um, infiltrates and keeps going, okay, and keep heading down toward the water table 400 meters below um, and toward the radioactivity that may be associated with the cavity that's left. As time progresses, fines do tend to wash into these craters, so you will decrease the amount of infiltration and eventually the landscape will return itself. Now, in, in, uh, in credit to the Department of Energy, they consider now, a conservative estimate is that all the radioactivity associated with each test whether it's above or below the water table, is now in the water table, okay, which, is, which takes into account the fact that eventually moisture will move down probably and, and uh, put the radioactivity into the water table. There'll be enhanced recharge. Okay, but again, we're not in this area. We're down in the south part where we think uh, there is, there's much less testing and much less surface disruption. Okay, so let's get on to some, some data analysis. How are we going to estimate recharge? First, let's look at modern recharge. What's going on today? Okay? There's a variety of ways we can estimate recharge. And a whole lot of different techniques out there. Darcy's Law, we can look at temperature profiles in the unsaturated zone. We could add artificial tracers to the land surface or somewhere in the Vado zone and see how far they move after some time. But as you're going to see, the rates of movement that we see in these sites are quite small. And uh, we'd have to be waiting a long time if we ran tracer experiments to see when things would move. And nobody wants to fund work for 50 or 60 years, okay? Nor do I want to do it for 50 or 60 years. All right, now, so what we can do is we can use environmental tracers, okay? Things that are naturally occurring that fall in the rain or some other source. Chloride is one. Tritium you've probably all heard of from atmospheric testing. Kind of a neat tracer. We know its input chronology. And let's see where it is in the unsaturated zone. Now, to estimate paleo recharge, what happened in the past, um, we have to pretty much stick with environmental tracers, okay? And again, chloride, chlorine-36, the radioactive isotope of chlorine, um, stable isotopes of water, oxygen-18 and deuterium, things like that. And we'll go through how we can use these tracers to estimate paleo recharge. But first, let's look at modern recharge. Now, one of the key things uh, that I'm going to show you is, and I hope you take home from this, and I'll reiterate it later, is that any one of these techniques that I'm going to show you has a lot of uncertainty, okay? Most of the things we do in hydrology have uncertainty. So we're going to use multiple independent methods, okay? We're going to try different techniques to analyze data and see if it all points in the same direction, okay? And this is something you should always do with any hypothesis testing in any of the science you do, but particularly in the unsaturated zone, we need these